Barry. Welcome to Educate, Inform, and Challenge. My name is Teresa McLennan. I'm the Executive Director here at the Women and Children's Shelter of Barrie. We are so thankful that you have joined us today. The goal of our show, of course, is to talk about lives and experiences of women. We talk about women in leadership. And we also try to create a forum where we can talk about the things that we need to educate, inform, and challenge ourselves with in terms of our thinking, what we knew to be true, things that we're not sure about, so that as a community, we can grow and we can have more empathy and understanding of other people and their experiences. Before we begin to dive in and have a great conversation with my wonderful guest today, Richard, we do want to acknowledge our Indigenous partners, history, culture. We thank you for allowing us to share in this space, to be on this land. We feel honored and privileged that you have allowed us to do that here. So welcome to my wonderful guest, Richard Lickers. And Richard was a key person in the development of the truth and reconciliation process and report. And so we really wanna dive into that. Of course, June is National Indigenous History Month, but this is an important conversation for us to have all the time. We need to bridge awareness in our community. And so Richard, welcome. I am honored to talk with you today. Thank you, Teresa. It's an honor to be here with you. Thank you. So, you know, let's just start at the beginning and we'll see where our conversation takes us. Mm -hmm. Talk to us about how truth and reconciliation came to be. Well, that's a, that goes quite a ways back. Eh? It was in a work in progress back in, I'm going to say early 70s, 80s, never really came into fruition until 2007. And I think it took that long to I, as a First Nations person, and even an individual, to be educated enough where we can put a program and even a, uh, how could I say, a letter together that can be understood by all walks of life, especially in the political realm, man. I mean, that's, that's the key battle right there. And it always has been for generations. And so as a people evolving into a, a higher form of education. There was a time even myself longing for a, a greater education and understanding, but yet in my generation, we were forced to go to work, much like our parents. So we never had that opportunity, but the generation coming up now, highly educated. And the, this is basically a, an outline for them to go forward and, and make the necessary changes and understanding that is needed. Putting it into perspective, when you talked about how different it can be for young people today and the opportunities that they have that were not there for yourself, your parents, your parents' parents, let's talk about why that was and what was happening generations before. Well, Just, I mean, that's a huge question I know to capture, but I think that's a good place to start. Well, to actually live through that, Teresa, a longing for a higher education, but yet never having the resources. So with all that said, the resources was one of the main reasons why the generations to follow would be better equipped to live a life, a life where they can be understood. So bridging that gap between the elders and the youth, that's where I came into play. In, in my lifespan, being brought up with, with elders such as my mom, for instance, who is a residential school survivor, who is no longer with us, but yet recognizing the, the pain and the suffering that, that she lived with and denying it, never having an opportunity to enter into her healing in a greater way. So that's where I came in as her son and entering into that healing journey on her behalf and my father's behalf. So, but I guess 
why it's so crucial and important to educate our kids now, highly intelligent generation. And for myself, never really having that opportunity, but yet having a heart to learn and to understand the sufferings that our ancestors have gone through and living with that in my own life and through my own personal experiences. I, mm -hmm. So this is the main reason why this draft was put together so that the, uh, the truth will be told and the relationships are going to be restored. You know, that's what we're believing for. You talked about, you know, your family history of residential schools. What impact does that history have on current generations about carrying that trauma that previous generations lived through? Well, I believe the impact is uh, recognizing, I'm going to kind of speak on behalf of some of my siblings who, who hold a, I'm going to say, a better root expectation towards all of this, the history of it all, and not even longing to, to look at their own issues in life and how it's affected them. For myself, I've made the choice to do that because I truly want to believe that we can move past all of this here, trauma from the past, and build stronger families and stronger relationships with the elders and with the youth that are coming up now. And like I say, that's, I was, I was once called a bridge builder. So bringing those two generations together has been kind of primarily what I've done in most of my walk in this truth and reconciliation. I only served on it for, for a short period of time before I went into addictions counseling. So, so that's kind of what led me to, to that further healing process. Eh? So that's very, very crucial. And I believe that you are a bridge builder uh, in the conversations that we're having today with the community, because these are these important conversations that we all need to be having continually. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. circling back to truth and reconciliation, mm -hmm. why is truth and reconciliation so important today? Well, you look at the, uh, diversity of culture now that we live in, even, even living here in Barrie. Primarily, my involvement was always with First Nations people. So coming into this area, now I work with a lot of uh, uh, multi-generational cultures. So and having that opportunity to educate them, to share with them, and to give them a greater understanding about who we are as a people and maybe what our rights are and maybe what our culture believes in and maybe even how at one time we were torn apart, but yet we've adapted, we've survived, and we've adjusted even to a point now where we're moving forward as a, as a stronger community. I'm hoping it's not always the case, but I've seen it already unfolding in our communities. And I know that we're going to talk more about the Truth, Truth and Reconciliation Commission report that has a whole whack of 94 maybe calls to action. Yeah. But in what yeah. you've described in terms of educating and being connected to youth, is that in its own way a call to action to them about how are they going to create a a uh, new future uh, with the knowledge that they're learning from elders, yourself, you know, key people mm -hmm. in their, their lives, right? In a way, is that its own call to action even within the Indigenous community? Absolutely, Teresa, for sure. You know, and uh, when you recognize, like I say, the resources that are really available for the generation now and highly educated, I mean, we're talking uh, kids with degrees and masters in political science and, and cultural studies, you know, all of these areas, it's for a reason, so that they can come into a place where 
after being educated about the traumas of the past and moving forward through uh, generational sufferings. That I'm going to always use my mom as an example. She went to her grave with a broken heart, but that broken heart it was, was rooted the days from the days that she was in that residential school. And there's a reason for that, but I really don't want to go into that just yet. But it's making our children aware that they have a great future in he- ahead of them, but they also have to know how to uh, uh, build their strong communities in the present time. And I can see that unfolding now. Eh? So if that kind of gives you a little bit of a perspective of what, what you're asking, mm-hmm. I, I keep leaning on that, building that bridge and, and connecting the elders Many of the elders never had the opportunity to get their freedom. They went to their graves in their pains. But that's, that's not to be said that we're not going to step up and continue on their journey for them. And that's where we're at. That's where I'm at. You know, so that's uh, what I believe in right now. I, I love your words, Richard. And I think that they're inspiring for all of us to hear because, you know, you can have the truth and reconciliation report, but it takes a community to make change happen. And for all of us yeah. to, to recognize what is our own call to action? Uh, yeah. You know, what can we do to be allies? What can we do to support? What mm-hmm. can we do, do to learn and be open to the learnings and to challenge mm-hmm what we are judgments because everyone has judgments assumptions right Mm -hmm. so we all have Mm -hmm. a call to action and so i'm just really loving our conversation and there's so much to talk (laughs) about and i i know a half an hour is not going to do any of it justice and we need so much more time but when we come back because we are going to take a short break i want to dive into truth and reconciliation, and really some of those calls to action. But Mm -hmm. I also want to hear what your thoughts are about barriers to success. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, some Mm -hmm. of the, maybe some of the same systemic barriers, oppressions, uh, discriminations that may still exist that we need to acknowledge so that we can be able to address them and work through. So Mm -hmm. I just encourage our community, please stay with us as we continue this great conversation with Richard so that we can educate ourselves, inform ourselves, and challenge ourselves. Stay tuned. We will be right back. This program is brought to you by Ignite TV. Now you're in command. Visit Rogers.com for more details. Summer days, summer nights, lots of things to do, places to go and people to see. If you're having a few drinks, be sure to plan ahead and get home safely. We don't want to pick you up. Drinking drivers risk injuries to themselves and others and take chances with their license, their jobs, and their future. Remember what's at stake and choose your ride, whether you're the driver, the passenger, or the party host. Thanks for supporting Sober Driving. I hope we never meet. Visit ArrivaLive.org to find out more. educate, inform, and challenge. We are having a great discussion today with Richard Lickers, who's talking to us a little bit about truth and reconciliation. But, you know, more importantly, I think is uh, Richard's own experience. And, you know, one of the things that he's highlighted that would be important for us to learn about today is his own healing journey and what that has looked like for him. So I think, Richard, you know what, that might be the place that we just want to dive back in. Mm -hmm. Can you talk to us about what your own journey has looked like and just how you are moving through that even today? uh, I'm going to start off with uh, where I was born on the Six Nations Reserve. I was actually born right on the reserve. 
at that time we had a hospital down there. <clears throat> so I was born right into the culture, right into the environment. And that's all I knew up until the days when I went to, to high school. So not knowing that there is a whole different culture and environment out there in the world, being isolated on a reservation. <clears throat> so becoming a Mohawk native from a wolf clan, that's who, I, that's who I thought my identity was as a First Nations person. And recognizing even back then as a child, and looking at the abuse and trauma that, that we lived in, that we thought was just natural. And it was a way of life. And I remember as a kid, sometimes busloads of tourists would come through our reserve. Eh? <clears throat> and I would hear these words coming out from those buses, calling us while well, we've been called pretty much every name in the book anyways, and, and recognizing, wow, that's pretty extreme someone taking a tour for, for through our reservation, looking at us all, us uh, poor little Indian people kicking around there, so to speak. And, that, and that's how I felt. I felt that low and that small when I came off the reserve. So I lived in a, a, a realm of fear, to so to speak, even going into high school and and, recognizing that racism was extreme, just a part of life, so I thought. But yet, as I grew older and be becoming somewhat even angry and resentful for that type of uh, lifestyle, and, I, and even my personal self wanted to leave the reserve and not look back, so I had enough of this life. I want to go and make a life and find my way. So recognizing that for instance and coming into a whole new culture and realizing that wow i wasn't prepared for this i wasn't prepared to to deal with uh society outside of the reserve being brought up in that isolation and and not to say that the reserve was all bad but yet living through uh trauma and horror became a lifestyle not realizing that that, that wasn't right. But as I grew older, I'm realizing how it affected my life as I became an adult and how it even drew me into to abuse myself and living in a tra traumatic relationships, for instance, dealing with substance abuse and so on and so forth, spiraling into a, into a dark place as I came out of a dark place and then realizing this ain't right, something needed to be done. So I realized and recognized that I needed to change my own life. You know, being, being uh, colonized to a, to a point of degree where we had to be submitted or surrendered to Christianity, so to speak. But yet, I also recognize that uh, Christianity has been so misrepresented over the years as I've come to know and, and walk in my spiritual realm, that uh, a lot of harm came through that. And that was the whole guise of, I believe, how colonization and, and the colonialism came into effect. So I look at the bigger picture in, in sense to that, eh? and I said, well, there's got to be something more to this uh, Christianity and uh, cultural walk that we can become strong allies together and understand each other. And that's where my heart was, because in, in reality, Christianity did touch my life and it always has impacted my life. And now I have a relationship with my creator, my God, in a strong way. But it's only due to the fact that the representation that I was exposed to and showed to was in the right way. And it's all rooted in love. And I said, that's the way it was meant to be, as far as I'm concerned. But with all of that said, I've seen the misrepresentation and how it's affected a people, my people, and many across the land, and how they've suffered for generations now. So the, necess the necessity of having a, a report, like Truth and Reconciliation, in all of the uh, 94 call to actions is crucial 
for us to be stronger together as a people and with our allies, government sector, the uh, 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 traditional sector, the uh, religious sector, all of it. We can build strong allies together as we work together in all of these areas. And all of these here, you know, whether it be health, whether it be education, whether it be healing, all of these are in this package. And it's a, and it's a strong concept of what we're trying to strive for and, and building strong, healthy communities. And that's what my elders taught me. As a child, growing up, being actively involved in sports and, and events in my community, it, it taught me that there is a better way to strengthen our communities and overcome the, op the obstacles that we've had to endure in the past. And we have, I see my mom go to the grave in her broken heart pain. She didn't have the strength nor the courage to step into that healing realm. And as I did my own healing, I brought her into my healing. And I shared that with her and from time to time her and my dad and and they were so thankful because they were affected by it also because they would know that something was something happened something some kind of freedom came to me and as I shared my story and my healing journey with them and on their behalf they also got free and healed in in that perspective so sharing your story, educating one another, being open to, to understand and accept each other as individuals, you know, doesn't matter what walk of life you're from, you know, and uh, we've all had our, our uh, I guess, sufferings in life, doesn't matter what your culture is, some maybe to more extreme than the others, but as finding our way as an as, uh, Ongwahone person, a First Nations person, it's very important to me because that's who I was created to be. And, and, I, and I long to, to uh, even in the generations coming up, helping those kids recognize who they are and who they were created to be. Yeah. I just, I really appreciate that history, uh, Richard. It's just such great learning for, for all of us, for me. I'm curious, um, you know, you talked about growing up on the reserve and, you know, and then there's negative influences that are happening in and to that community. Mm -hmm. Can you give us an idea about what maybe life on the reserve was like when it was whole, when it was uh, not being influenced by these maybe outside things like people on buses coming through Mm -hmm. You know, because I think it would be just really great to get a sense about the, the history, the culture, the family life, the experience mm -hmm. on reserve, because people may have in their minds what they see now on mm -hmm. TV and media. But I think it would be healthy to know, was that really what it was like before we did our damage to that? Mm -hmm. Well, that's a pretty solid question. You know, when you when you think of that, uh, my culture and my native people were people of the longhouse. So we looked at our way of living as where the sun came up and the sun went down. So we would be, even as, the, as nature taught us how we would migrate through the land, not to deplete resources, but to replenish it. So when you go to an area for your hunting, for your resources, you don't take it where it's stripped bare. You know when they say oh, it's time to move on, nature will tell you that. Creator God will show you this is time to move on. And, and that's how we did. We, we, uh, we lived in a land free to be who we were and migrate and provide from our, for our families in those regions, in those areas. I mean, I think we were all positioned in certain areas in this here North American continent. So I guess what I'm saying is we were never meant to be on reservations. And that is part of the, uh, uh, the whole reason why truth and reconciliation came into effect because 
we were people of the land, roaming freely, providing for our families and living what was given to us so that we could honor and respect that. And, but for now, that's a hard question saying, what was it like in, in your original state? It was probably horrible. My guess is when we were first put into those, those communities, and from, from what I've heard from my ancestors, they were stripped of a total identity. So it took seven generations to rebuild that, that identity back and recognizing who we are as uh, First Nations people. Mm -hmm. So if that kind of answers your question a little bit. Yeah, I think it sets a perspective that, you know, a lot of us don't think about and, and know mm -hmm. about, right? So I really appreciate your thoughts to that. Mm -hmm. our, our conversation time, Richard, has gone by so fast. And I would love to continue talking with you because I, I am learning so much. And I mm -hmm. hope and I know that our listeners are as well. I think I would like to really pass along the last word to you. How do all of us become allies and partners and supporters to truth and reconciliation and just really the Indigenous community? Just tell me what I can do to be an ally. Well, Teresa, from what I understand and what I see, you're doing it. You know, this is, this is very important. You know, one person said it to me this way. Do not despise the small beginnings because it could flourish into something great. Mm -hmm. So when we do community awareness, even your TV program here, you know, it's educating those who desire to listen, those who desire to hear. But yet, there comes a point where we all have a story to be told, you know, and just listening to that story and hearing the hearts of the individual, whether it's a good story or whether it's a traumatic story, doesn't matter. If we have ears to hear what the heart is saying, and I think it's so important how we can build strong allies with one another. When I came up here to Barrie, I'm learning from uh, Muslim people, I'm learning from Hindu people, I'm learning from uh, Persian people, I'm learning from all walks of life now, and their struggles are much the same as all of us. And just recognizing and hearing the heart's cry of those people and saying, we can relate and we can understand one another. Richard, I think you said it beautifully. And I think that those are all words for us to live by. And if we could only all have that openness to wanting to learn about each other, show compassion for each other and empathy, mm -hmm. that we all carry a traumatic story yes. uh, somewhere on a scale of trauma what affects me will affect someone else differently. Right. If we still carry the trauma and that trauma impacts our behavior. Our time has gone by so fast. Thank you so much. And thank you to our community for being with us on this journey. Stay with us. And we hope to see you next time on Educate, Inform, and Challenge. Bye-bye. TV viewer response line. Email us or connect with us on social media. Being stuck in your home during this pandemic also means you have a home. Waiting in line for groceries means you have money for groceries. The isolation, being broke and totally scared about what's next. I was feeling that before this crisis.